you know, that song expresses such wonderful, wonderful sentiments. As that last verse that, that uh, Ethan uh, pointed out, that let thy goodness, like a fetter, like a binder, like a binder, you know, Paul went to, uh, to seek to damage the Lord's church, although he didn't perceive it as that, but that was the result. And he would take Christians out of their home, the believers of the way, and put them in fetters to bind them. And so these fetters that we, we, we sang about this, this morning, then the last verse of the song we just sang, that they let thy goodness, the goodness of God, be a fetter. It binds me to him to draw me to him. You know, uh, we are constrained for, by many different things. You know, uh, I remember, and it, it, it uh, was a shock to me. I remember my mother and I had a, a pretty uh, revealing conversation one time that I had not thought about uh, being a, uh, a child of, you know, uh, of course I was a teenager, but the son of my mother, that uh, she had made sacrifices for me. You know, growing up and your, your, your parents are always there and they're guiding you, they're commanding you, they're, they're, they're constraining you in certain behaviors. Don't go here. Do right things. You know, spend time with good folks, not, not those who have bad influences. And as I see this, they're always there. I take it for granted that uh, they're making sacrifices. I remember that uh, 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 regarding the choices that my folks made, that uh, they thought it best that she would remain at home as, the, as, as we were being reared, that, we would, that the children would benefit most from it, that they would, uh, if you think about one of the most important uh, achievements in this world that you can possibly make is to rear up your children to be God-fearing, good, productive individuals in our society, people of whom you can be proud, sons and daughters of whom you can be proud. But that requires sacrifice. That requires time. And the fact that it, it, it struck me finally my mother and father had made sacrifices for me. And I, I said, well, how? And, said, there, and I, I understand now their love for us, our, my, my siblings and myself, constrained him to make sacrifices. And so as we look at the book of James, that as, he, as we see in, in the, the opening passage, I'm sorry, not James, but rather Jude, the book of Jude, the, the first book, the book right before uh, Revelation, the second book, to the second to the last book of the, of the Bible, Jude writes, uh, uh, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me, the American Standard says, that I was constrained to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith. So Jude was constrained to write on certain things, particularly about contending for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Paul was constrained in his love for Christ that it caused him to commit himself to a life of preaching the gospel so that the constraining fetters, as it were, the goodness of God. Um, as we think about God and his word, you know, we are very, very uh, uh, blessed to have in our possession, every one of us, have a possession of the Word of God. The Word of God. That is a revelation to us from our God, from the Creator of the universe, to tell us, to teach us who He is, what He values, and why we are where we are, and His solution for that. Of course, I, I'm talking about sin, and God's solution for sin, and God's only solution for sin, that is the only solution that's viable. We spoke about this, mor that this morning in Bible class, but that we have at our disposal, at our immediate access, the Word of God. And as Paul wrote, the Word of God is the power, into, is God's power into salvation. You know, we think about God's Word verbally. We see in Genesis chapter 1, in the very beginning, that God was creating all things by His power. And He did that through His spoken Word. We see in Genesis 1, verse 3, verse 6, verse 9, 11, 14, 20, 24. You know what it said? 
And God said. And when he said it, it became reality. You think of the power of God's spoken word. We also see, you know, it's found nine times in Genesis 1. I just uh, related the, the verses particularly. In every instance, it came to pass. We also look at Christ, his only begotten son, that before he was God's be only begotten son, that he was the word in heaven. He had a relationship with God, much like as we would think of a word and what it represents. As we think of, there is a, a, a noun, such as son, that references whom? What? Uh, a descendant of myself or yourselves, okay? And so that word that signifies that idea is so closely related that one cannot exist without the other. There are new inventions, inventions that come along as we develop our technologies that we have to invent new words to describe them. Okay? The old language that described thoughts and, and ideas and, and, and real things in the, in the ages past just don't suffice because they don't describe accurately. Right. So one thing I think of now is rocket. Of course, it's been several, you know, uh, several hundred years. We, we, when we go back to the very beginning, I suppose the Chinese should be uh, attributed to these, the invention of rockets with their, with their uh, fireworks and such. But as we consider useful purposes other than the, the appearance of beautiful, in, uh, <laughs> inspiring lights in the sky, but uh, rather you, being able to do useful work, we have to go back to the development of the rocket for launching payloads into space okay and with rockets we've been able to launch payloads and land and walk around on the moon and we have launched and landed uh, um, probes onto the planet Mars we've gone beyond our own solar system we yes we had Voyagers 1 and 2 have begun the our, beyond our solar system beyond the influence of the Sun and we are taking back data learning about the universe around us as best we can and so as we invented this uh, vehicle to launch uh, payloads beyond the, 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 uh, the gravitational pull of the Earth, we had to invent a word, rocket. And so when we think about a rocket, what do we think about? The actual thing, whether it's called a rocket or not, but the, the, the idea of one with the other is so closely related that if you didn't have the word to describe it, well, you wouldn't have an object that needed to be described. And so as we see as the relationship to God and the word, God the Father and the word, was such that the word, when one thought of the word, he thought of that second member of the Godhead. And if there were no second member of the Godhead, that, that word, the word, would not exist. So the, John was painting a picture for us of the closeness of the second member of the Godhead to God, the Father. And when he was incarnated upon this earth, that a body had been prepared for him and was conceived in the Virgin Mary, that... Uh, 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 he became that, uh, that God in man, God with us, you know, uh, various names that are, that are given. But as we look at this second member of the Godhead, himself being God, as John related in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we know that Word is Jesus Christ because in, in verse 14 he's, he declares that, and the Word became flesh. Well, who became flesh? Who was God with us? Who was God in the flesh? Jesus Christ. So Jesus, before he was incarnated in a physical body, was with God as the Word. And so Christ himself being God, himself having authority and the authority that he had upon this earth, even to raise the dead. In John 11, verses 32 through 47, you recall the account of Jesus speaking, says Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, of course, having been dead, been in that tomb for days. And as, as uh, his sister related, he stinketh. Okay, so he was, he was going through decay, the natural decay. As our, as our spirit departs the body, the body ceases to, to function as it ought, and so it begins to decay, natural biological processes. And so as Jesus said, Lazarus, come out, he called him back. His spirit re-entered into that body from the Hadean realm, showing the authority of Christ that as he came back, he cried out to Lazarus himself. Now, uh, an interesting thought is that what if he had not declared Lazarus specifically? What would happen? Well, how many people around, how many bodies around were there 
in the area when G if Jesus had said, just rise and come out, how many would rise and come out? How, by what authority? We know that in the last day, when Christ returns, all shall come out of the grave. It'll be by his authority that that occurs. And so we see the, the authority of Jesus having declared specifically Lazarus come out. We show that he commanded him, his spirit returned from the Hadean realm, and Lazarus came out from that tomb. The, the, the power of Christ's word. The power of Christ's word to heal the lame in Matthew 21, verses 14 and 15. To, to multiply the loaves and fishes as he fed 5,000 with just a few loaves and a, and a few fishes, Matthew 14, 13 through 21. And to control the elements, to control the weather with just his word, Matthew 8, 23 through 27. You recall Jesus had just gotten into, into the boat to cross the sea and as disciples were in them, and it, as it was typical in that, in that particular area because of the mountains surrounding the, uh, on, on the side of the sea, that the weather patterns were such that storms could quickly arise. You could look in the sky and it was clear, but in an hour's time it was uh, tumultuous. That, uh, that's what happened when they were sailing along, Jesus quietly slumbering in the, in the blow decks. And as that, that storm came, tossing that boat, the disciples came, became fearful and they came down to Jesus don't you care? We're perishing. Here's a song we have in our, our songbooks. Um, <clears throat> uh, Master of the Tempest is Raging. And it relates that event when Christ calmed the seas as the tempest was there. And then it relates that principle as we put our faith in Christ. As the tempest will come in our own lives that Christ has the calming power. And so as Christ he got up on the decks. He's, of course, declaring, you little faith. And then he, he says, be silent, wind. Be silent, waves. And everything smoothly come out. And what was the response from his disciples? Who is he that even the waves and the wind obey his voice? Okay, what a marvel. And, of course, it's being a miracle. But the authority of Christ and his word, the power that, that is declared in his spoken word, now, we recognize, as I mentioned earlier, this is the word of God. This is God's revelation to us to reveal himself and his desires for us and his nature and his character, what he likes and what he dislikes, and how much he's sacrificed on our behalf. So as we look at the power of the written word, this being God's written word, the power of the word, the Bible does declare for itself the value and the effect that it has on us and for us. Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. It illuminates us. It brings us to understanding true wisdom. That is the wisdom that comes from God, as James discusses it, uh, uh, James 1 and, and uh, other passages in that book. But also, as we consider it to illuminate us, and with that teaching, what else happens? It creates faith. You know, Romans 10, 17. For faith cometh of hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes, the faith in God, the right kind of faith that has good effects, that, has effect, that is effectual, uh, it comes from the hearing of the word of God. Not, not about mathematics, not about physics, not about some other religious organization, or some other man who had cool ideas, good ideas about how to live one with another, how to live peacefully with one another. These are good, well and good. However, the words we need to hear for our salvation because of our sins is from the word of God. In fact, it's from Romans 10, 17. When we go back to Romans 1, it talks about how the Gentiles have rejected God from their knowledge. And chapter 2, how even the Jews who would who'd condemn the Gentiles, rightly so for their rejection of God, that Paul reveals to them in his writings that they were as guilty as the Gentiles were doing the very same things that the, that the Gentiles whom they condemn were doing. And so do they think that they would escape the judgment of God if they being guilty of the same things, that they, God would not see them as guilty of the same things? And so Paul puts everything in perspective that all stand before God sinful. As we look at in uh, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us. Um, and then he goes on to declare God's solution in faith, in him, and in Christ.
that in that faith, in our, uh, that faith that motivates us to obedience, that therein does God justify us because of the blood that Jesus Christ shed upon the cross. Not because we are so great, so smart, so, so uh, effective in good works, any good works we might do, if we are doing this for the sole purpose of earning salvation, we're barking up the wrong tree. Because salvation comes only in our faith in God, coupled with, as James declares, with works that, that, that uh, exemplify what our faith really is. James made the note that you do believe that God is one, you, you, that is good, you do well. But even the demons tremble. They tremble with fear of God. They know, but yet they don't have what we have. They have not been given the opportunity that we have been given. They stand condemned because of their rebellion against God. But what about us? In our rebellion against God, in our turning away from him, from our, our sinful behavior, uh, self, uh, self, uh, um, self-serving uh, efforts, and, um, and all, all this that... that uh, we have turned away from God. Our sins stand before But God has given us an opportunity because of the price that Jesus Christ has paid. Jesus Christ paid that price instead of ourselves. So as we look at the power of God that it teaches us, uh, to give us understanding, and it creates faith in us, John 20, verse 30, John tells us why he wrote the, the gospel account. He tells us, John 20, verse 30, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So that John relates to us. In fact, first John, he talks about having fellowship with us and, 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 and teaching us what he and the other apostles observed, how they, what they beheld, what they tasted, what they touched in the presence of Jesus as he was ministering upon this earth, they are relating, plus the fact that they saw him alive again, for the purpose that we can join in fellowship with John, who has fellowship with the Father, who has fellowship with Christ, who has fellowship with the other apostles. And so his wanting us, all of us, to have this fellowship teaches us. And so as he writes the Gospel account of John, that uh, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Just might. Just might. Doesn't say you will. It's up to us, though. It's up to our choice whether we believe what John wrote or not. The word of God, the written word, makes us wise into salvation. In 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul writes regarding that faith that was in him. Where did it come from? Where did that faith come from? Let's read. And that from a child that has known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Interesting to note that holy scriptures that Timothy had were what? What we consider the Old Testament. The scriptures from the, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the, and, the, and the poetry, the Psalms. These are the three uh, uh, departments, you might say, that, or classifications that Christ has mentioned. There's the law the prophets, and the Psalms. Law, Psalms, and prophets. Then, so all these were able to make Timothy wise in the salvation. In the same way, they may uh, make us wise in salvation, but we have the added benefit of the revelation of Jesus Christ that, that the Old Testament put in action. The Old Testament is the New Testament in prospect, in prophecy. The New Testament is the Old Testament fulfilled, and that's what we see in Jesus Christ. So it may, the word of God, the written word of God, makes us wise to salvation. It's able to save our souls, as James writes in James 1.21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Now, that is a, a, a quaint uh, phraseology that uh, we understand. Being the word of God, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. So as we consider these, these, these words, uh, you know, superfluity of naughtiness, let's consider the, a more modern translation, the American Standard Version. That was translated in the uh, 19th century toward the end of that and was published for us in 1901 in America. Okay, um, as he wrote in, in James 121, wherefore putting away all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness. Overflowing of wickedness. Hey, think about 
the life of folks that their wickedness is so great that it overflows. It just pours out. And so putting away all this overflowing wickedness, receive with meekness the implanted word. Engrafted, implanted, you know, the word is the seed. Remember the, the, the parable of the sower. And as Jesus related the meaning of that parable, the soils, of course, with the different conditions of the heart, the different situations that men and women find themselves in, why they would reject the word of God, or having received it, would turn her back, turn around. Remember Lot's wife? She turned around and looked back. So why would they reject God and Christ and salvation altogether? And then what soils are rich for cultivating the word of God? Okay. But then the seed was revealed as, uh, as the word of God, the seed. You think about the implanted word, planted in our hearts. You know, the Bible heart is the core of man. Our heart is not just the center of our, our emotions. It's the center of our intellect. It's the center of our will, our control, our, our resolve. And so as the word of God implanted in our hearts, all of these, that it takes root. And as that implanted word, to receive this, this meekness and grafted word, which is able to save your souls. The written word of God is able to save your souls. That's how powerful the word is. In fact, in Psalm 119, verse 154, plead my cause and deliver me. Quicken me according to thy word. That's another antiquated phrase we don't think of, but we can know what that means. It means to make alive, okay? to enliven, to make me alive according to thy word. According to thy word. The word of God is alive and active, as, as the Hebrews writer writes. I believe that it was Paul who penned this, but there's no absolute proof but nevertheless, we do recognize that the Hebrews letter is inspired by God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And has, as the writer writes in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. As the American Standard puts it, for the word of God is living and active. So if something that's powerful, something that's active, that's the word of God. But if it remains in this book, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not enabling us. It doesn't quicken us. It doesn't make us alive. So the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts to the quick. And cuts to the life. It, and piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit. You know, can you distinguish between your soul and your spirit? The, the uh, study of these two terms, sometimes we think we understand clearly what it is. Sometimes they're used interact interchangeably. It's soul also means spirit. But as we look at the, the distinction, is there, it's so close, we think about the joints in the marrow or the bones in the marrow, that as we, we, we cut through a bone, you know, the, uh, many people contribute their bodies to, the, the, to science, and in so doing, the education, and many uh, uh, biology students are able to uh, look at, at this, and so as they sever the bones, even in, in cases of amputation, you can see the bone structure of it, and you look at, you know there's the bone marrow right in the middle, and we've learned that, that the marrow, it, it's, it's the marrow that, that generates our red blood cells, which are so essential for our life. And, but then we also see the hardness on the outside. And so we're trying to discern where is it that the bone ceases and the marrow begins is very difficult. But yet the word of God is able, is able like a scalpel, to, to sever at that transition, right at that point where it is actually bone and marrow. That's how sharp it is. And so it is. The word of God can sever, it can cut right down to divide our souls and our spirit. That's how powerful the word of God is. Uh, both joints and marrow. And quick to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. King James says, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Doesn't it reveal to us? Not just what we're thinking. We can see uh, the, the, the behavior of those uh, steeped in sin and their thought patterns. It declares that. But it also reveals to us the motivations behind this. And doesn't it uh, talk to us, revealing to ourselves what really is going on inside us? What motivates us? What would cause us to be, behave in such a way? Uh, a sinful way? Doesn't it reveal it to us? And doesn't it, don't we see by implication the the, the condemnation that's there and that with those motivations the results are 
So therefore, being honest with ourselves, we can say, I need to put this stuff away. I need to drop all this because it's bad behavior. It's unworthy of the dignity of man to behave in such a way. And that's what the Word of God does. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents and intents of the heart. It's quick to discern. It's a mirror to our souls, as James 1, 22-25 says. It's a mirror to ourselves. We can read that and say, it's like it's writing about me. And I can see where I need to make adjustments. As God reveals to us, I know what's going in your mind, going on in your mind. I know what's going on in your will. I know why you're doing these things. And let me tell you why. And so as we read this, it just sheds away those shell, onion shells of what we, the, the barriers we might put up, not only to others, but barriers before our own eyes. It starts to trim, cut away at that as we serious with ourselves, honest with ourselves. And because of that, it, it will draw us nigh to God, close to God, as we seek truth and to be honest. And the word of God in this converts the soul. Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So we find wisdom in there, but it converts the soul too as we are convicted with his word of our own lives and our own motivations. Because his desire is that we see clearly who we are and come to Him and find life in Him and a genuine relationship with Him. The Word of God also makes clean. John 15, 3, as Jesus said to His disciples, Now ye are clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. So it makes clean. And it feeds the soul. 1 Peter 2, 1. The Word of God Feeds the soul. First Peter 2, 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile, deception, and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking as newborn babes desire the sincere miracle of the word, that ye may grow thereby. So we ought to desire the word of God, the sincere milk of the word, as we, it's related to a nutritious drink. New sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby in our spiritual growth, the feeding that, w that we have upon our exposure to the word of God, as we read it and study it, we grow spiritually. Do you want to grow? Do you want to grow spiritually? Sink yourself into Bible study. It's the word of God that feeds the soul. You know, we are... We are physical beings and we know we need physical nutrition and the right physical nutrition to grow and be healthy. That our, bo that our body will function the way God intended it to, serving us as vehicles to, as we get about this world. But we're also spirit. And both the body, as, just as the body needs feeding to sustain itself, so our spirit needs feeding to, sus to sustain itself. We need something that causes us to be spiritually alive. And the word of God God knows what makes us alive. God knows all about us. We are created in his own image. Certainly God would know what we need. God knows what we need to be spiritually fed. It's interesting that some people come desiring to hear what they, they think they ought to hear. That they know what they need to grow spiritually. And for the most part, I think there we do have ideas what we need to do. But God knows particularly. It's God who knows what we need. It's in his word that we learn and are fed. He knows the topics we need to study, and it's already in his word. You know, we, sometimes we look at, particularly when you look at the Old Testament, and you read about the kings and all the things they did that were wrong, and how God condemns them, and we say, well, you know, that's not really relevant to my life. We don't, we don't even live in a monarchy, you know. And we live in, in a technological society, and so many things have changed. Our culture, the way we expect others to behave, our, our norms... And, and they're so different. So it does, when I read about these old kings, it doesn't, I don't even relate. It doesn't make sense to me. But you know what? The thing is, God knows what we need. And to think that the, the, the studies in the, old, in the scriptures, both Old Testament and New, are irrelevant, it's, it's, a, 
it's uh, accusing God of not knowing what we really need to know. It's accusing God that he hadn't given us what is really beneficial to us. You know, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, John chapter 3. Why he came by night, the Bible doesn't reveal to us. Uh, we don't know if he was so busy during the day or whether he was trying to, to uh, obscure his approach to Jesus. But um, he did come by night and ask questions of Jesus. Jesus didn't waste any time getting down to serious business. Here he was a ruler of the Jews, should have known the law of Moses quite well. And so when Jesus began to teach him, I tell you truly, you must be born again before you see the kingdom of heaven. Born again? Can a man enter into the, 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 his mother's womb being full grown? Of course, that's an absurdity. He missed the point, and so Jesus had to get more specific. Uh, except you be born of the water and the spirit. You need to be born spiritually. That you need to be born according to the instructions of the Holy Spirit, teaching your spirit and renewing your mind. But also be born of the water. The, 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 there is much written in the New Testament regarding that, that watery grave of baptism wherein we, as we submit ourselves to the will of the Father in obedience to the commands of our Savior Jesus Christ, we are buried in that water. And when we rise up, we come to rise to walk in newness of life. We're born again. We re our minds are renewed because of the teaching of the Spirit, but also uh, we have, have, as we symbolically rise up, as Christ died and was buried, he rose up again to walk. So we too are buried in water to rise up to walk in newness of life. There is a change that takes place. And it's therein that we touch the blood of Christ that cleanses us. It's therein that, uh, that, uh, uh, that God forgives us. In every case, look at the New Testament. Every case. When they were taught, they may have been specific, uh, different initial instructions, but finally, they were all finished by an obedience to Christ to be baptized for remission of sins. And therein, it's because that's where they become, come to touch with the blood of Christ. It's there, in their obedience, they submit themselves, their will to God's will, and God will forgive them all the other things being required, of course, faith. Faith in God. Faith in Christ. Confessing Jesus Christ as the Son of God and repenting of one's sins. Having done all these things in one's obedience to the gospel and, and, and being baptized finds forgiveness. And the Lord adds that one to his body, the church of Christ. And, and as we consider that God's word directs us to all of this, makes us understand all of this and the reasoning behind it, we grow by the sincere milk of the word to, new, to uh, new, uh, give our spirits nutrition, spiritual nutrition that we grow by thereby. And so God teaches us through his word, and so we shouldn't um, neglect it because we think it's irrelevant. I tell you, Jesus told Nicodemus exactly what he needed to hear for his understanding about God's plan of redemption to save Nicodemus' soul. He didn't waste it. And, and uh, the fact that Nicodemus thought it was unusual didn't change the facts. So God, Jesus told Nicodemus what he needed to hear. And so God teaches us what we need to hear, what we need to study in his word. You know, God's word is God's word, whether written or spoken, whether God speaks it verbally or if it's written and recorded for us in the written form. It's his word. There is as much power in the written word as there is in the spoken word. If Jesus were here personally with you today, he would be saying the same exact things because all of this is are his words. And so whether he speaks it verbally or whether he relates it to us through the written page, that is still carries the same authority. And Jesus' words will stand forever. As he said in Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. It's important to remember that Jesus' words will judge us. John 12, verses 47 through 50. Jesus' words will judge us. Paul knew where the power to save resides. It wasn't in superpowers, miracles. It wasn't in great demonstrations. It wasn't in the ability to persuade men with great oratory. Paul was probably a pretty good orator. 
He had a great education by, by those days' standards. He studied under the, the feet of one of the greatest of that day, Gamaliel. And yet, he compared all the, those achievements he had as dumb. The power that Paul knew to salvation, for salvation, it was in the word of God. Romans 1, beginning of verse 15. So as much as in me is, writing to the church in Rome, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to go to Rome and preach to them the gospel, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, to all mankind, all flesh. It's the power of God to save you. It's the ability of God to save you. That's what God uses to save us, is the education we receive from his word and knowing what we must believe and what we must do in order to be saved, in order to be forgiven of our sins. As we see in verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, or more literally, out of faith into faith. So at the faith system that God had in the Old Testament, they did were required to live by their faith. But in those statutes and their rituals and their observances, they still had faith. So out of faith from the old law into faith in the new law of Christ, in the spirit, as it's referred to oftentimes, that therein is the righteousness of God revealed. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The word of God is the power of God into salvation. The word of God teaches us, it educates us, it prepares us to understand how we can be saved and why that salvation works and satisfies God's justice. The invitation is given. If you find you need to obey the gospel to receive forgiveness of sin, then come forward as we stand and as we sing.